are R Roberto de Cosimo and Fred Atherton. Um, they're going to be talking about intrinsic identifiers. Super interesting stuff. Uh, the two of you are set. Uh, you want to pull up your slides? If you have them. First of all, cheers. I mean, here we are. <laughs> I'm so jealous of everyone draw, drawing up a glass of wine. But okay, come in. We are in Paris. We need some wine. And uh, uh, okay. So here are my slides, which are here online. Yes, we maybe can see I would like. Fantastic. So let me start. Um, first of all, pleasure to be uh, here with all of you today. Sorry, not being able to, to cheer in real life, but let's try. I try to put, to put up some party environment somehow at home. We'll see how it fares. So today, I'm going to try to introduce you to uh, the notion of intrinsic identifiers, and in particular, a kind of intrinsic identifier, the soft edge identifiers, which are uh, extremely useful and used in uh, for software in particular software source code today. I have already uploaded in the chat a link to the full slides if you want to download them, so you, you have everything set. So a few words about me, just in case you want to know. I will not go through everything, just uh, I am a computer scientist, I'm a teacher, I'm a researcher, I'm, I'm a free software advocate and developer, and now I'm getting old, so I'm start, starting to spend part of my time on, in uh, building and directing organization for the common good. Uh, so the subject of today is intrinsic identifiers. But before talking about intrinsic identifiers that probably some of you do not know yet, let me remind about extrinsic identifiers that everybody knows perfectly well. Okay, What are extrinsic identifiers? Well, that's a terminology we use to, to indicate identifiers where you use a correspond to, you keep the correspondence between the identifier and the object in a register because there is no clear connection between the identifier and the object by itself. This is very old technology, okay? If you take your passport number, social security number, the ISBN, the ISSN, and tons of other identifiers, your driver license number, they all work like this, okay? It works very well on paper. Now with the internet era, we have a, a digital version of this kind of technology. So you know many of these, DOIs, handles, ARKs, persistent URLs, error IDs, and you name it, I mean, a ton of them. These are extrinsic because there is no uh, intimate binding between the identifier and the object itself. My only remark here about the terminology that I hear used a lot of, uh, of time around the world is about persistent identifiers. Uh, let me just, clarify what I see in the term persistent here. These adjectives can be kind of ambiguous. Actually, the technology which is based on a register cannot guarantee any persistent at all by itself. The persistent comes from elsewhere. Just to remind you a little bit of how things, these things work that you know much better than me. When I have an extrinsic identifier, a DOI or handle, an ARC or whatever, I'm a user, I enter this identifier in some resolver somewhere. I need to go uh, to a register here, this directory server that tells me, ah, okay, this identifier corresponds to this location. Then with this location, I mean redirected to another place in the world, and this location identifier, I get some content. But you see, now I need to trust two entities. I mean, the register that keeps the correspondence between the identifier and the location, and the server or the entity that keeps the correspondence between the, the location, the URL, and the object I want to get. And there is no way I can see if any of these two entities is making changes behind the door, so behind the scenes for me. Uh, so the persistence doesn't come from the technology. It comes from the people that run these services that need to make sure the correspondence is there. So the persistence is not in the identifier, it is in the system that people like you that maintain this correspondence. And this actually is part of the specification if you are geek and curious, I mean, this link here, yeah, the blue things in the slides are links, uh, show you how actually you can get uh, this in the original specification of the under system. Well. With this out of the door, intrinsic identifiers go the other way around, okay? So you do not want to have a register to keep a correspondence or a resolver to keep a correspondence between the identifier and the object. 
And again, before the internet, we already had a ton of this kind of system. Typically, the musical notation, we are a party, right? So, for example, C0 is a do, for, for Italians, like P, this is do, not C, uh, uh, of the subcontract. Hey, we know it, no need to have a register, it is just a standard for the notation. Same for chemistry. Okay, chemical notation is standard, so you have NaCl, it is chlor, uh, uh, sodium chloride, so it's just table sub. And now in the uh, internet era, this notion of intrinsic identifier has become extremely popular because we have technology like cryptographic hashes that have been widespread over the past 20 years for uh, distributed software development and unfortunately very popular today because of cryptocurrency which are polluting the, the, the space of, of our civilization quite, quite a bit. Uh, well, if you look at what happened, I mean, uh, in the history of software development, we have gone through different kind of stages. I mean, we had register-based identifier, then we moved to centralized system. And then finally, beginning of the 2000s, we actually moved massively to this interest identifier. So while the scientific breakthrough dates back for over 30 years, actually adoption is very recent. And now you have over 40 million developers worldwide using these identifiers and, and you find them in hundreds of million repositories on GitHub, GitLab, Blackhead, etc. Et so here, the persistence is actually built in. There is no way somebody can change the content or the identifiers and pretend they are connected because you can check it by just computing the hash by yourself. Now, the, the good news is that today, these identifiers are easily available for all of you to use on software, in particular source code, uh, using the Software Heritage uh, Archive. So what is the Software Heritage? Software Heritage is an initiative that has been uh, in the making for over five years now, that has as a mission to actually go out, collect, preserve, and share all the software source code ever written. Uh, today we have over 150 million repositories already uh, archive and counting. And this is also addressing some of the key needs you find in research, in the world of research for research source code. So in particular, we keep track of all this source code and we archive it, so we make sure it is not lost. We provide this identifier for everything inside it, so make sure it is not, uh, you know exactly what you are pointing at. And we also try to help in the describing, making findable software and uh, make it excitable to give credit to the authors. This is a long-term non-profit initiative, okay? So there is a broad support coming from academia and government. You have some entities listed here, you should know some of them. Uh, it is also supported by industry because, again, we do not archive just research software, we archive everything under the sun. And so what are these software heritage identifiers, which is a particular case of intrinsic identifiers for software? But here is an example of a software heritage identifier. You have a prefix. It's WH, which is registered in IANA today. Uh, uh, tells you this is a software identifier. You have a schema version for the identifier. You have a tag that tells you what is a content type. You can have many content types. You can identify a file, a directory, a revision, a release, a snapshot. These are concepts which are particularly relevant in software. And then you have this long string here, which is a cryptographic hash computed exactly from uh, the object itself. So you do not need to pre-register or identify it, it's just computable by anybody. Uh, also, this kind of identifier also have a kind of uh, qualifiers for context that can be very useful to understand where this object has been found, etc. These kind of identifiers are now standard. For example, in, in industry, you have the sort of package data exchange maintained by the Linux Foundation that referenced this. Uh, the prefix is registered in Indiana. There is a property in Wikidata for this kind of identifiers. And you can actually play with them and, and enhance research papers by having full pointers to exactly the snippet of code you are interested in. For example, here in this link that I have embedded by using one of these identifiers, I can actually uh, bring to you, let me see if I can get this. Uh, you see behind the scene here, the link is coming up. Wait, I'm doing a little bit of a mess with the things. Uh, where is it? Here we are. So 
I clicked on the link and now I am on an excerpt of the source code of the Apollo 11 guidance computer, exactly the line I'm interested in. I mean, the place where you turn the lamb around to land on the moon. And actually you can uh, look for this kind of software all over the, the, uh, the, the archive, find the content inside the archive and reference, uh, let me see, I mean, time is running out. So and reference any, any piece of thought which is already archived there. And as a researcher, for me, this is a real game changer in the way it is. It, it helps me having better uh, research papers. But you may ask yourself, okay, how can I get my software in this kind of archive? How can I get this kind of identifiers? Well, the good news is that since we are harvesting everything under the sun, probably most of the software you're interested in is already archived, okay? Because you go out, harvest it, build it, build the archive, and provide identifier for everything. But if it is not the case, anybody can trigger archival or some interesting piece of software around the world by using the save connect functionality, or uh, partner with, with us to get a, a, a deposit functionality offered to them. This is now being adopted in, in research, so there are connections with national portal in France, which is called HAL, with a reference uh, um, archive of mathematical software maintained in Germany by SWMRF, by many, uh, let me close this, many uh, journals, IPOL, eLife, you, you will hear the story in, just after this presentation, the Journal of Techn uh, Theoretical Computation and Applied Mechanics, and many others. And this is also now part of policy. So for example, in France, the National Plan for Open Science, this is recommended. You have a report in the EOSC, European Open Science Cloud, produced just a month ago that explains how to use it and why it is nice. And you have guidelines for researchers. So I mean, just to give time for Fred to show you. If you want to learn more, if you want to see the demo, the full demo, I didn't have time to do this. There is this video on YouTube you can watch and you find everything. There are blogs, there are documentation you can find on the slides. But that was a long talk, and my idea was just to give you an introduction, and then instead of listening to me, I would like you to, to listen to Frederick, who will tell you how and why they moved to adopt these kind of identifiers and how this helps inside the production process at eLife. So I will stop here, and Fred, you are on stage. Thank you, Roberto. I'll uh, share my slides. Uh, let me stop. How do I stop share sharing here? This. OK. OK. So um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Fred. I'm Operations Manager at eLife. Um, if you're not familiar with eLife, it's um, an open access, online only, uh, nonprofit Medical and Life Sciences Journal, and I'm going to talk about uh, archiving our code. Um, so we had two main aims when it came to um, our author software. The first aim was that uh, any code created for an eLife article should be archived and freely available so that it can be reproduced without restriction. Um, where possible, the, the version history should be retained. The second aim is um, that the code should be widely accessible so that the authors can be properly acknowledged and, and the software can be properly cited. So here's a simplified version of our publishing pipeline. Um, source files are sent from our submission system to our vendors who generate the proofs for those files. Uh, the vendors then send the proofs out to the authors who, who carry out proofing. The authors return the proofs to eLife staff who do a final check on the article before proceeding with publication. So it's a pretty, a pretty standard publishing workflow. Um, we had a, a first solution to, to this problem, um, and we initially did so using GitHub. Um, we had a dedicated GitHub organization where we, we forked any code, um, essentially creating a, a snapshot of the software at time of publication. Um, it's relatively simple for, for software which is already stored in GitHub, um, it's a click or two of, of a button, essentially. Um, but for software stored elsewhere, it's a little bit more onerous. Um, we had to manually create a repo under our organization and import the code from wherever it was stored. Um, 
depending on the contents of the original repo, it could take a long time, and, and we often stumble across problems such as uh, massive or a large number of files or problematic dependencies with the code, um, which then required further manual intervention. And uh, obviously, this had to be done for every single repo, and, and you know, um, scientific articles they can they can have numerous repos associated with them. Um, Another issue was that, uh, regrettably, some, some authors had not yet licensed their code in their repos. And uh, before, um, that, since that's best practice, before we actually forked the, the repo, we would wait for them to uh, um, do so before, before, we, before we forked the code. Um, but most importantly, um, there wasn't a PID. The closest thing was um, the git commit hash. So we turned to Software Heritage. Um, and here's what we did. Uh, first, our editorial team asked that um, authors place their code in a repository and license it. And uh, they, they also asked that, that any other kind of software packages are appropriately cited. Um, the vendors identify the code that the authors have created because we're only interested in code that they've generated for, for this particular article, um, for these purposes, obviously. Um, that, that requires a, a manual check since the authors could cite code created by other people, obviously, and, and we provide them with guidance on how to identify whether the code was, was generated as part of the article or not. Um, more on that later. They, they, our vendors archive the code at Software Heritage as appropriate and, and uh, will add the, the SWIDs into the article, the Software Heritage IDs. Um, and if the Original code, it wasn't licensed, then they'd add a, a, a proofing query for the authors and, and ask them to um, to license their code. So then they send the proofs out to the authors. Um, the authors will receive the proofs, and if they haven't licensed their code, we hope they do so at this stage. Um, finally, eLife staff will check uh, that all the appropriate code has been, has been archived. Um, if the authors have updated the code during proofing, which they may do, or, for example, like adding um, a license or just you know, correcting any errors or, or changing formatting, then we can um, update the archive version pretty easily. Um, and then finally, we move on to publication. So uh, since, since our content um, was captured um, as, as JATS at XML, XML, which is the nicest standard format for journal articles, we can use tools like um, Schematron to, to flag mentions of, of code in, in the text to, to vendors, to our vendors and to eLife staff and also to um, ensure that the SWIDs have been added correctly to the article. So here's an example from um, a code availability statement. Um, you can see that the authors have cited, well, added to the text the, the original GitHub repo here. Um, and you can see that the, the SWID has been added afterwards. So um, this is the SWID that we used. It's the revision SWID. Um, so that's capturing the, the latest commit to that repo. And embedded in that text is a, is a URL that has the, the full SWID with all of the context. Um, and you can see that that's just appended to uh, softwareheritage.org. So we can, we can do a couple of things here. Firstly, um, we can check that the revision SWID is present in the text. So we can check that they match. And secondly, we can check that the, um, the origin URL matches the, the one that um, precedes the SWID. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated if the authors are referring to specific files or lines of code, but uh, um, if, we, if we limit our checks to these, these kinds of general statements about the availability of code, then um, that, that's fine for our purposes to ensure that uh, the software has been archived and that the correct SWID and URL are used. So here are our challenges adopting this new procedure. Firstly, we had to train our vendors to carry it out. Um, it wasn't too problematic. We were in the fortunate position that they'd already been doing some forking of code using our old procedure. So it wasn't a, a dissimilar process. Um, so it turned out to be relatively seamless. With, with the additional checks that um, using a tool like Schematron afford us, we, could, we can provide them with automated and immediate feedback if they've used the incorrect SWID or URL. Another challenge for us was that um, the SWIDs are quite lengthy because um, they contain so much additional information. Um, and a, a, another limitation of ours was that um, the current proofing system that we were using was unable to embed hyperlinks and text in the specific section where they're most likely to be used in um, data and code avail availability statements. 
Um, so we had to include the full link. Um, we, we updated the CSS to wrap particularly long uh, URLs on our site, and we're currently using the, the shorter revision link in those sections, but using the full SWIDs with all the context um, in the main text and, and in references. Um, for very large repos, um, it can take longer for those for those to be archived. Um, typically, we've noticed it takes less than 20 minutes, and in many cases, it's essentially instantaneous. So these are exceptions, really. But um, our simple workaround for these cases was to um, include placeholder text at the vendor stage before the authors have seen the, the proofs. And then once the authors have finished proofing, um, which typically takes about two days, um, then uh, we can add in the SWIDs at that later date because the, the code will have been archived by that stage. So here are the benefits of the, the new procedure as we see them. Um, first and foremost, we're using PIDs, which we weren't previously, so that's, that's a good thing, obviously. Um, another benefit is that we retain one of the main uh, benefits of the previous solution. Um, that is that the, the versioning history of the code is, is retained. Um, and as I've said, we can we can programmatically ensure that the content has has been added correctly to the article, avoiding the potential introduction of errors. Um, this process is a lot less manual than our previous process, especially for for repos and code which wasn't stored in in GitHub. And uh, we no longer have to wait for authors to license their code before arch archiving it. We can we can archive it at at the uh, um, at the stage that we want and then update it later. And we can still continue to nudge them towards best practices. So the next steps for us are to um, use the directory SWID in all places when we can um, embed links in, in all places that we want to in our proofing system. Um, I'm sure Roberto will, will explain why those are better. Um, we would also like to archive uh, eLife executable research articles uh, on publication. These um, these are articles that are enriched with uh, code and data that can be executed in the browser. So you can change parameters of the code, re-execute it in the, in the browser, and see what the output of that would be. Um, and we want to archive that, that, uh, those articles at Software Heritage as well. Um, and then for those few authors that still provide code as files and refuse to put it on uh, repos, um, we, we can um, use the, uh, the direct um, way of archiving that Roberto referred to earlier. Um, we'd like to see that in, in the near future as well. Um, and with that, um, I think I'll, I'll pass back to, to Todd and to questions. Yes, yeah, so too many windows open. Get it in there. There were two questions already. I want to remind people if they want to ask any questions or get involved, you could use the Q&A functionality that's under ask a question. Or uh, you can also say something in the chat, and we're following that as well. Um, <clears throat> so a question for Roberto. And I think you might have mentioned this in the chat, but we'll let's get it into the recording. Um, is the only way to get these identifiers through the Software Heritage project. And uh, Roberto, I think you are on mute. So let's turn on you mute. back on. <laughs> there you go. You're okay. not on mute anymore. <laughs> OK. Thanks a lot. So I wonder if I can show, how do I show? OK, here it is on the, the share screen. Let me show in application window to answer the question in, in a very concrete way. So um, uh, is it share, showing this? Yes, the full point of intrinsic identifier is that you can compute it yourself. So in principle, you can attribute software edge identifier, you can extract software edge identifier by yourself just from the code. So you remember the piece of uh, code from the Apollo 11 source code I showed you before, but I actually just downloaded it uh here it is you see january 27 19 28 i just downloaded this file right away i mean if you look at the content is exactly the source code we have seen remember okay now i can use a standard command which is a uh, 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 used by, by software developers every day to compute the identifier, the, intrinsic, the, the hash of the intrinsic identifier 
this way. And if we go, you just remember the first and the last uh, lines to see I'm not cheating, okay? So it's uh, 64 at the beginning, 0, 09 at the end. Now, if I go back to the source code we had, let me see if I have the window open here. Here it is. Now, let me show this to you. Location window, this one. Okay. Okay, you remember, I'm not cheating, okay? This is exactly what you have seen before. I mean, the same, the same uh, window, same slide. Now, if I you open this permalink box that, uh, that uh, provides us with the full intrinsic identifiers, as provided already for you for the archive. The archive is computing them for you, but you can compute them yourselves. You see 64 at the beginning, 0, 09 at the end. And we are really not cheating. It's, you can compute it by yourself. The advantage of getting the identifier from software heritage instead of computing them yourself, if you need it, is that you can have all this contextual information to tell you where we have found what, so you can find the same view on the archive. And you are sure the software is already also archived and not just identified. But of course, you can compute identifier yourself. It is the full point <laughs> of using intrinsic identifiers. That was question one. Um, another qu a related question to that is this systems in uh, systems independent. So in terms of line breaks or uh, you know which you know platform you might be using. Yes, yeah, so that, that's an interesting question. Now let, let me be very clear. So these these are content based identifiers. So if you change the content, you change a line break with your carriage right or something like this, this will change the identifier. And it is normal that you get another identifier because in computing, when you do programming, changing a bit in your source code can change completely what happens. Because you do not want to make a conversion between line breaks or something. You really don't want to do that. So it has been a long debate many, many, many years ago. So there are automatic conversions done by your system if needed. But I mean, for the original content you are looking at, we check it bit by bit. So don't touch anything, otherwise it changes. But I mean, the way you compute this is actually system independent. Um, let's see, I see that you um, have been answering some of the questions uh, in the Q&A. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, let's get that onto the recording. So you're asked, do you ask authors to archive the code or do vendors do that on your behalf? Maybe Fred can answer. Yeah, the, the vendors are doing that on our behalf. We're, we're trying to um, make the, the publishing process as seamless as possible for authors. And they're already jumping through so many hoops in order to, to publish that we, um, if we can take a task away from them, then that would be a good thing. Uh, May I, I add a comment on this? I mean, this save code now functionality is open to anybody around the planet. So you can come to archive.softwareedge.org or directly to save.softwareedge.org, and you can point in our crawlers to wherever there is a piece of interesting software that you want to be archived, and it will be archived on your behalf. So then this is interesting because you can archive even software of authors who are no longer there, or software that is needed in a paper, but you don't know the authors, or maybe the authors are software developers that do not care at all about scientific publication. The software is still needed. You can still archive it. It is just one click. And then one last question before we need to move on. Uh, when you say archive processing time, are you ref referring to the delay time for the SWH to re-index a repository to present it? Or is it uh, just the, how long it takes to create the hash? That, that's, uh, no, it's, it's uh, the time for archiving something. I mean, if the content is already in our archive, then you have nothing to do. If it is not yet in the archive, then we need to go fetch it and uh, ingest it in the archive and, and prepare it, everything. So typically the ingestion time is seconds, okay, to ingest something. Unless you are ingesting the full source code of LibreOffice or the Linux kernel, they can take a few minutes. Uh, the delay is actually the fact that we are uh, indexing millions of repositories. Okay, so usually you get in a queue and you need to wait for your turn to come in. When, once you are uh, on top of the queue, it is extremely quick. 
Uh, but if needed, I mean, for uh, for publication processing of pipelines, etc., we can definitely prioritize uh, uh, requests that come from publishers, and that, that's not a big deal. We just didn't do it right now because it was not needed. Usually, in an hour or two, you go to the to the head of the pipeline. If you really need to go it in two seconds, let us know. We, we will try to do to make it work. Okay. All right. Well, fantastic. Thank you both.